Welcome back to the Bander Pod, the engaging and enlivening podcast of Bandersnatch Books. We're a small press publisher of treasures found off the beaten path for lovers of all that is good, true, and beautiful. I'm Annie Beth Donahue, and today I'll be your host as we're talking with author Millie Florence about the artist's identity. Millie is the author of The Balter of Ashton Harper, recently published by Bandersnatch Books. Millie Florence, welcome to the Bander Pod. Thank you so much for having me. I am very excited. Well, great. Glad to have you here. So to get this conversation rolling, tell our listeners about your book. Yeah, of course. It is a historical fantasy set in the Regency era. So I like to say, think of Jane Austen, but with magic and adventure and written for kids. So The Balter of Ashton Harper is the story of 12-year-old Ashton Harper, who has three problems, and two of them are his sisters. And the third problem is the opportunity he has to audition for a scholarship at his dream school, where he would get to learn how to do ballroom dancing, which he absolutely loves, and the challenges that come along with that. And on the journey to audition for this school, he discovers some mysterious magic, which perhaps would have been better left alone. And adventure ensues. And if you'd like to give a little plug for Honey Butter, you can do that too. Yeah. My first book that I published, Honey Butter, I published it when I was 13 years old. And you can actually get that one, the ebook and audiobook, for free on my website, millieflorence.com. That one is a contemporary, and it is the story of seven-year-old Jamie Johnson, who is obsessed with collecting paint cards, and what happens to her when she befriends the slightly mysterious homeschooler, Lauren Lark. All right, so in The Balter of Ashton Harper, Ashton's gifting feels like a curse to him at first. Mm -hmm. Why do you think artists... Well, everyone really, but especially artists, are in such danger of mixing up their gift with their identity. So, for example, Millie, I'm thinking like our identity in Christ Mm -hmm. is, you know, the the roots of where we're coming from, right? But our, our calling, our gifts are something different than that. So what part of our gift is for us and what's for others? It's it's a very many layered question, deep like mm-hmm. those roots that we're talking about. Um, what I've heard a lot is, you know, people will say, "You're not a writer; you are a person who writes." Mm-hmm. And the idea that what you love to do, what you're passionate about, what your calling is, ultimately, no matter how much you love it, it still is something you do. It's not who you are. And it can become really dangerous to associate yourself and your self-worth with your performance in any area of life. But there's, there's a very unique danger about associating it with something that you love to do because that can kind of... So like, especially as an artist, if you are creating for the sake of an outcome, it can make that art feel hollow, whether that art is writing or, in Ashton's case, ballroom dancing. The main thing that he struggles with throughout the book is that he feels like his dancing and what he loves to do isn't worth it unless he succeeds, unless he finds like material success, unless he gets into this school, unless he can actually make a career out of it. And the whole journey of the book is about looking at this at this whole question from many different angles. The, the way I, I phrase it a lot of the time is, are dreams worth dreaming even if they don't come true? Gotcha. That's kind of the main, main thematic question of the book. And it definitely came from a very personal place in my own life because I was coming off of uh, 2020 <laughs> and all of the chaos that was 2020 when I was writing this book. Specifically, there were several book events that I got invited to do that then got canceled. I thought 2020 was going to be my year, and now I'm not seeing any of that material success that I thought I would be able to see. And so it was really 
a personal journey for me to ask that question, are dreams worth dreaming if they don't come true? How do you go about creating art for the sake of itself? That question is what sparked the idea for the Balter of Ashton Harper to begin with. For a while, I'd wanted to write some historical fantasy, something in the Regency era, because I was very um, into Jane Austen. So I kind of combined that thematic question with the ideas I'd, I'd had with Balter and chose to explore it because stories are kind of how I explore life and figure life out. Yeah, I know you said this is kind of coming from personal experience. And I've also had a similar experience where I had originally planned on doing something in the English writing space. And then I didn't because it wasn't quite practical. And like you said, if you're not going to succeed greatly in this endeavor or have lots of material success, why would we do that? Right? Yeah. Why do you think people who lean more towards the liberal arts are more susceptible? I think because we are told how important art is which it is. You you get told as an artist, you know, your book can change someone's life, right? Mm, Yeah. And so I think a lot of artists, myself included, see that as very much a a duty and a calling and something really important because you can make a difference in the world. You can make an impact. And you, you know, you think about like the books you've read that have really changed your life and you want to do that. But that's a lot of pressure to put on yourself. <laughs> and it can be easy to feel like, well, if if I if my book isn't getting read, just using like books as an example, is it doing what it's meant to do, right? Is it actually changing someone's life? I I heard a really good answer for that at the Realm Makers Conference a few years ago, which is a Christian fantasy writers conference. I was in a session. The leader of the session said, Would you rather write a book a thousand people read but then forgot about as soon as they finished it or would you rather write a book that only one person read but their life was changed by it forever and of course everyone in the class said I would rather write a book that changes one person's life forever and he said okay but what if that one person was you oh (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that so that that really changed the way I looked at writing and creating and making art in general. That the process of creating and the process of being an artist, a writer, a dancer, a poet, a, a painter is just as much about how the art affects you. And so that's part of the point of art is doing it for the sake of itself. It's for the act of creating itself. But I can absolutely, like I said, see why artists get into this headspace of everyone tells me art is so important and can be so powerful. So I better make my art really good and really important and really powerful. Right. Right. And speaking of the the mixing up of the gift with the identity, and you tell me if you agree with this, for artists, it's a lot easier to mix that up because... The thing you're creating often has pieces of your own identity in it. Yes, exactly. Yeah, well, and I just said, like, the whole plot of the Balter of Ashton Harper came from a lot of personal experience for me, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of the ways that writers use art and a lot, like, artists in general, painters as well, is to explore their reality. The act of creating art is very personal process. So it is very easy for artists to let their art become their identity because, like you said, a lot of it is pieces of themselves. Mm -hmm. So it can be difficult to separate that. I think you ultimately have to separate yourself from the art to a degree. It's, It's a very tricky balance when you think about it because, again... And this is where it goes in circles and why I think it's so difficult for artists, right? Is the more personal art is, the more likely it is to be powerful and affect other people. But then the more likely it is that your identity gets wrapped up in it, which can be a very unhealthy thing. 
So I think it's I think it's a delicate balance and I think that balance is going to look a little bit different for every person and it's it's not really something that can be taught. I think it's something you kind of have to pray about and write about and grapple with in your own heart to figure out for yourself. But I think it is something that should be talked about more because it is a very real thing and that's not really the top 10 questions that writers or artists or painters or filmmakers get asked, but it is definitely part of the process of growing as an artist. Yeah. So I recently read an article about an author who was very prolific. And then something happened. I think, I don't think she had a stroke, but I think she had some kind of traumatic brain injury. And when she recovered, she realized that it was really difficult to write. That was hard for her to adjust to because writing was was her identity. She had made it her identity. She had, uh, like I said, just this vast body of where it's not like she'd written a book or two and you know on the side or whatever. Like this was her life. She talked about figuring out how to continue to write, even though it was laborious and it took her a lot longer. She had to have a different process because she couldn't keep things in her her imagination. Stuff would slip from her mind. So she had all these note cards and like she had to do more visual scene plotting. And she said she would write pieces and write pieces and write pieces and then like arrange them and put them together. Mm -hmm. This was a different, um, a whole different level. Yeah. right, Right. Exactly. And so it did make me think about the identity versus the calling, when we lose the ability to do what we used to be able to do, how does that affect how we feel about ourselves, how we feel about our work? And, you know, there are probably no answers to that because um, that's going to be different for everybody. But yeah, there's no one answer. And I this very much, all of this is very much still lessons that I am learning. Mm-hmm. Like that's the reason I wrote Balter is to continue to kind of learn and figure that out. I will say, I think you can really only find your true identity in God, right? Mm -hmm. And everything else is just things he has given you to express that identity. So writing is one way to express that identity for me. Again, for other people, there's tons of other art forms or even outside of art, like science and Um, athletics and sports and things Mm -hmm. that's all really just an expression of who you are it is not who you are again I I don't have the best here's the answer to the question because I very it's a deep question right yeah it's personal it's very personal depending on you know the individual uh, on the person yeah Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but it is something to think about yes it's definitely questions we should be asking and discussing and like every person needs to spend the time to grapple with because it's very important. I'll say this until this right now, this podcast with you, I had not even thought about the fact that in my book, no clues you lose the main character. While this is my my book is a mystery. So it's not like, you know, it doesn't have the same themes as yours, but one of the underlying issues is the main character has anxiety and she is on a sports team, a wheelchair basketball team. Mm -hmm. And she does identify very heavily with how well she plays basketball, wheelchair basketball. Yeah. And that, that has not yet been resolved. This is supposed to be a series. So there will be more character development later. Yes, of course. (laughs) But when you said, you know, athletics, like we could do this with anything, right? Like she's doing it with athletics and actually she already has a disability. So she, she doesn't play the traditional, traditional basketball, but she is great at her wheelchair basketball. So I think, like you were saying, like we have different ways that we're gifted and different ways we can express our identity, even when something changes. Now she was a lifelong wheelchair user, so it didn't change for her. But if someone did have a situation where their abilities changed and then they said, well, that's okay, I'm going to do this other thing instead. Like, are we just going to continue in that cycle of now this is the thing that I'm good at? Like, you know, at some point you have to come to the end of yourself, right? And just say, if I wasn't able to do any of these things. You know. I would I would still be me, right? Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, okay. So the next question is a little more lighthearted. Speaking of identity as an author, what are the joys and pitfalls of write what you know 
versus inventing a world. So for example, in No Clues You Lose, I did write what I knew from real life experience. Everyone in our family has some kind of disability or chronic health problem. My daughter does play wheelchair basketball, or at least she did. She aged out last year. But you wrote your book based on a world that was completely out of your imagination. How does that identity, how does your author identity work its way into that? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, You know, you hear it a lot, write what you know. And I think when a lot of, especially new authors, hear write what you know, they think of it in a very physical sense. I know what my bedroom looks like. I know what it's like, as you said, to play basketball for your daughter, wheelchair basketball. In reality, I think write what you know is more about the emotion than the actual physical experience. Even though someone has never fought a dragon, people do know what it's like to feel fear and the heat of fire. It's kind of like a collage in fantasy, like you're kind of pulling together all these experiences from real life, but just combining them in a different way. So again, like in the in the dragon situation, people have know what it's like to feel scales, snakeskin. People know what, what heat and fire is like. People know what fear feels like. Um, you can learn how to hold a sword. So while you've never fought a dragon before, you can put together this collage of real life experiences that you do know and make that feel very, very real because in both the small physical experiences and in the emotion it is real so that has always been my approach to writing fantasy and a fantastical world there's a lovely quote i don't remember who it's by right now i we i can look it up and send it to you after we finish recording but the quote is the two most engaging powers of an author are to make new things familiar and familiar things new Oh, yeah, I've heard that. Yes, yes. And I've always loved that quote. Um, And yeah, so to take the idea that you can take a fantastical world and make it feel real, uh, like something that could actually happen from your own personal experiences, that is something a writer can do. You can also take, as someone who's also written contemporary, a very real, perhaps, quote unquote, boring everyday life experience and make it feel exciting and put higher stakes on in my book honey butter collecting paint cards simply because of how you delve into that emotion so i think it all comes back to the human experience of emotion because there are so many people who relate very strongly to fantasy novels but Obviously, none of them have ever, again, fought a dragon, but they relate to the emotion. So I think the emotion and those human feelings and experiences are what make a fantastical story real. Yeah, like the the comforts of home can be translated into a little hobbit hole or exactly, yeah, Mr. Beaver's house or whatever. Yeah, that's a really good point. So do you think there are any pitfalls to it, though? Like any? Um, I think... <laughs> any pitfalls to the idea of show don't tell well yeah. again i think i think show don't tell applies more to emotion so there's not really pitfalls to that but in terms of like the actual physical experience are there pitfalls i think yes there can be often again as a newer writer or even as a more experienced writer there are just things you don't think about that when you're writing fantasy in just from a world building perspective, like I know, you know, from editing with me, I didn't realize that they didn't have countertops in the Regency era. That wasn't a thing. <laughs> um, and there's lots of like small stuff like that, that you, you have to very intentionally think about when you're writing a fantasy world. Where do they get food and water if they're out in the middle of nowhere right like you have to think about all of that and how the how do plumbing systems work and that sort of thing so building a world can be very very complicated for that reason you have to be a lot more intentional about it whereas if you are writing something in a real life situation all of that is built in right Mm -hmm. and people will automatically assume and understand 
the world building of a story set in the modern world whereas in a fantasy world even this is just another layer to it even as the author if you know how a certain thing works it might still confuse your modern readers Mm -hmm. um like for example in the balter of ashton harper i did a ton of research on the regency era still didn't know they didn't have countertops um (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but I did a ton of research on the Regency era, and I mentioned several things that were historically accurate to that era, like uh, Ashton's cravat neckcloth or ZZ's dance card. And then I had beta readers be like, what's that? I don't know what you're oh. talking about. Whatever. Mm-hmm. And I had to, I have to explain it. So I think that that's a potential pitfall when mm-hmm. you're creating a world of your own. There's this layer of you as the author have to know how it works. But then you also have to make sure the reader knows how it works. All while making sure that that exposition doesn't bog down the story and the emotion, which is the important part. So I think I think that's definitely a difficulty of writing in either a fantasy world or a historical world, although fantasy and historical tend to overlap a decent amount, even outside of specifically historical fantasy. Yeah, yeah, that totally makes sense. All right, are you ready for some popcorn questions? I am so ready, yes. <laughs> All right, okay. What is your favorite word? Balter. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I like that. I like that. What is your favorite snack? Ice cream. Does that count? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I hope it's not dinner. So let's yeah. go with snack. All right. And what is your favorite treasure found off the beaten path? Ooh. Ah, I am I am torn between saying old keys or used books and there's a reason behind that because I've always found old cool looking keys fascinating ever since I read The Secret Garden when I was very very young and I love the idea of finding something mysterious that can lead you into a new place because a key is just not an object it also is kind of an invitation for adventure because then you have to find out where it goes what does it unlock And I guess a a book is very much the same, like a used book, because it's not just an object. It's also an invitation to adventure, to read the story between the pages. And I just love used bookstores. If we're talking about, you know, like I said earlier with art, doing things for the sake of them, looking through a used bookstore is something you should do just for the sake of itself, even if you don't buy anything. I love to browse through used bookstores and open books and just like read the first sentence and then wonder, okay, well, what story do I think is going to to come next? So I guess. Yeah. And there's the mystery of who owned this book. Yes. Before it fell into my hands. Yes, exactly. I've, I've found many books that have like inscriptions on the inside or something like that. And it's, it's very interesting to see. So, yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. All right. Well, thank you for being here with us today, Millie. Of course. This was so fun. May you find bookish treasures in your wanderings off the beaten path. Thanks for listening in to our conversation today on The Banderpod. We hope you'll check out our full catalog at bandersnatchbooks.com. The Banderpod is produced by Rachel S. Donahue, A.B. Donahue, and Carolyn Claire Gibbons. Audio engineering by S.D.G. Morgan. Artwork by Evelyn Warnemundy. Many thanks to our friend Chris Slayton of Son of Laughter for our theme song, Cricket in a Jar. Find links and more in the show notes.